What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here yet, you just haven't done it, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button now below so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about another mafia topic, and I'm going to go to the DMs for this one been asked by multiple people to cover one of the most respected individuals in the history of the mafia was not Italian. Some people compared him to Meyer Lansky. Some people compared him to Jimmy Burke. We're going to talk about today the fascinating life of one of John Gotti's favorite people, Joe Watts. Next on the sit down, Joe Watts was born in 1942. And Interestingly enough, his father actually was not Italian, so uh, he would always, in his career, connected to the mob, he would never truly be able to become a full-fledged member. However, uh, that would not preclude him from being very respected, very involved, and very high up. By the 70s, he was a big-time loan shark and a feared enforcer and killer. He would come up under the tutelage in the family of Carlo Gambino. And he would gain the respect very quickly of big Paul Castellano. The truth of the matter was, if you could give him an envelope, Paul Castellano was always willing to protect you when it mattered most. And that would happen in the 70s. Interestingly enough, as I said, uh, Joe Watts was a respected individual. However, in 1979, he would actually get into an argument with an individual called Jerry Chili. Jerry Chili was a, in his own right, very uh, lethal Bonanno family killer. And according to a witness in the bar that night, that individual would say that Jerry Chili actually verbally assaulted Joe Watts. Now, there was no actual punches thrown, but Jerry Chili was not always willing uh, to play by the rules. And Joe Watts took it as a slight. Joe Watts was, by this point, as I said, respected by Paul Castellano, who was making a lot of money for the family through his loan sharking operations. He would go to Castellano to have Jerry Chili taken out. And this shows you how much respect Joe Watts had. He was an associate at the time, a non-made member. He was going to have another a member who was made whacked. Paul Castellano agrees with Joe Watts and says he should be killed for this. What would happen, though, is by this point, Jerry Chili is connected. He goes to his Kappa regime, Dominic Big Trinchinchera and Alphonse Sonny Red and Delicato, one of the uh, higher ups in the Bonanno crime family. Sonny Red meets with Neil De La Croce, who gets uh, this contract. They have a sit down. Basically, Sonny Red says, look, Neil, we're not fucking killing Jerry Chili over an associate. He's a, a member of my family. It's not going to happen. De La Croce responds, quote, then shelve the fucking guy. Jerry Chili would be shelved. Sonny Red actually agrees with Neil and shelves Jerry Chili over the insults. This is how much respect Joe Watts had. Interestingly enough, uh, Jerry Chili would not uh, go down without a fight. He, after the three coppers were taken out, would actually return to the family uh, and come under the auspice of uh, Bonanno Capo, Patrick, Patty from the Bronx, Di Filippo. At one point, uh, Chili, who was said to march to the beat of his own drum, will quote, say, fuck those guys in Queens. Um, so Jerry Chili was a lunatic in his own right. Uh, he would uh, resurface, though. But for Joe Watts, he was very early respected in this life. And he was awarded the respect that May guys were getting. And Mikey Scars D. Leonardo would talk about that known uh, in the mid 70s. They'd actually would uh, come together and become friends. And Mikey Scars would talk glowingly about Joe Watts. He was one of the classiest guys he ever met. Um, he was, quote, uh, the most underrated guy in the history of the mafia. And that when he met John Gotti, John didn't know how to dress before he met Joe Watts. At one point, Scars D. Leonardo would actually also compare Joe Watts to Meyer Lansky. A lot of respect afforded to Joe Watts. By 1985, as we know, uh, up-and-comer John Gotti decides to take the family into his control by having Paul Castellano whacked in front of Spark Steakhouse. Interestingly enough, that night, Joe Watts was a backup shooter in that case, and he would actually get a large windfall 
from that hit. He, after the hit, would be given Tommy Bellotti's little black loan sharking book. And for a loan shark of Watts's caliber already, that was huge. He would become a very rich man due to getting that loan shark book. Joe Watts knew how to dress, and he could buy himself a lot of new suits. He could also buy a lot of new real estate. He would purchase two homes of the very trendy Casey Key in the Florida Keys. At one point, locals would regard Casey Key as, quote, treasure island due to the high-level homes that were built. Joe Watts would have multiple palatial pads uh, in his name. And however, this would come back to haunt Joe Watts, and we'll get to that in just a second. So Joe Watts, while he can't become a made man, is becoming very much on the same level as one, and he's making a lot more money than most. And for Paul Castellano, he loved the envelope. And now new boss, John Gotti, loved the envelope. And they became very close as well. By 1989, though, things would start to unravel just a little bit for Joe Watts. That uh, time, uh, Gambino heavyweight Jimmy Brown failure would report to the Ravenite Social Club and have a sit-down with John Gotti. Sammy Gravano would contend that Jimmy Brown failure would pull him aside and let him know that they had a canary in the family. Failure's cousin, Tommy Sparrow Spinelli, was allegedly becoming an informant for the FBI, and failure wanted his cousin whacked. He goes to Gravano. Joe Watts becomes involved in well. And according to the FBI, Joe Watts was a main kind of thoroughfare for getting uh, Spinelli killed. Gravano would also contend that through uh, J- uh, Joe Watts' connection to the Westies, he was a liaison. He would call upon an individual named John Fogarty, who was a Westies member, to dig the hole and to get rid of Spinelli. Um, Spinelli ultimately would be, be killed. And this would become a problem for people like Joe Watts. Uh, as we know, Gravano would cooperate and would basically feed him this murder conspiracy. Jimmy Brown would end up uh, getting arrested and convicted. He would die in prison. Also involved in this conspiracy was Joe Watts. Now, Joe Watts would call upon famed defense attorney F. Lee Bailey to take care of his case. Now, interestingly enough, in 1995, F. Lee Bailey had his own case to deal with. That, uh, in the case of Orenthal James Simpson, a.k.a. O.J. Simpson, And after that case, he would then take on Joe Watts' involvement in the Tommy Spinelli hit. Uh, Every Bailey would tell the Staten Island Advance and later in life that he looked forward to cross-examining Sam Gravano. He would never get the chance, though. The FBI would offer Joe uh, Watts uh, a nice sweetheart deal and award him six years if he would plead guilty to that murder conspiracy. And he would obviously accept and he would go to prison. Joe Watts, uh, for the first time in his life, faced some uncertainty. He would report to prison on a six-year sentence. Throughout the late 90s, the family would assume control of the rest of the Gotti family, and Joe Watts would sit inside and wait for his day of freedom. He wouldn't get it, though. In 2001, the FBI would indict Joe Watts again in a loan sharking and money laundering case. The old homes in uh, Casey Key would come back to haunt Joe Watts. The feds would allege that he would use almost $4 million in illegal loan proceeds that he would launder through two Manhattan developers. Uh, They would then take the money and invest it in properties that he wanted in Casey Key. One of the individuals involved was a art dealer in Manhattan named Anthony D. Lorenzo. The feds would contend Joe Watts would use him to launder money and then indeed purchase the homes uh, that he wanted. Uh, D. Lorenzo and another individual uh, would be brought in this indictment as well. So Joe Watts would have to remain behind prison. This is what the feds do. You think you're getting out, then they hit you with new charges. Uh, Joe Watts would end up being found guilty in that case and would go to prison until 2006. So you know, some of those big time purchases that Joe Watts was making, the feds knew it was illicit money and they were going to come back to haunt Joe Watts. And they sure did. Now, by this point, the government knew Joe Watts was very respected. They knew he was as respected as the mob knew how respected he was and that he was a main conduit for not only Paul Castellano, but for Gotti as well. They would contend that Joe Watts had an upwards of 10 hits on his record. Now, Joe Watts would also be brought in a case involving a 
a lunatic that supposedly shot at John Gotti outside the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, an individual named William Ciccone. Uh, Joe Watts would actually be exonerated in that case. So Joe Watts was killing people. He was getting off, but he was taking care of pieces of work for the family. Um, as we kind of end out where Joe Watts is now, and before we get into the last prison sentence Joe Watts would have to talk about and deal with, I want to get to a situation that we would learn in the trials in the mid-2000s of Joe Watts. This would involve um, a beautiful, buxom blonde uh, seen here uh, named uh, Lorette Marone. Um, Marone was the estranged wife of Joe Watts. Now, she would be called upon to speak about her relationship with Joe Watts uh, from 1980 to 1996, when then became estranged. The powers that be would find some really interesting information about Miss Marone, and I wanted to bring this up. The feds would contend. Now, again, she was never brought in, in any sort of cases here, but the website AmericanMafia.com would reveal in 2001 that Joe Watts's former wife was basically a matchmaker for swingers and that she had a website called angelscouples.com and an AOL profile would boast, according to that website, that she was, quote, a 5'8", blonde hair, uh, brown-eyed, athletic blonde with legs up to here. She would also uh, discuss that on her website, for the meager sum of $80, you and your partner could swap uh, in a wife swap swingers lifestyle. And she would also tell you that if you came to these wild sex parties, you can meet lawyers, policemen, and all sorts of other people uh, in a wild sexual rendezvous. So it was kind of interesting. This is obviously something that Joe Watts was not necessarily a part of, but his wife was actually doing her own thing. She would also boast that she had yacht sex parties and all sorts of other things, um, and that no single men were allowed at these little rendezvous. So that was kind of a little interesting piece of information that the former estranged wife, I got to admit, I wouldn't mind seeing her at a sex party uh, that she was doing uh, in um, shadow of her husband. Now, ultimately for Joe Watts, he wouldn't be out very long as he got out in 2006. In 2009, uh, Mr. Watts would be indicted again uh, in what the feds would call uh, a murder uh, of an individual named Fred Weiss. Now, Fred Weiss was uh, someone from Staten Island. He was a uh, magnet uh, in the real estate uh, developing world. He was also part of a carding company. He was a bon vivant, if you will, on the island. And he was involved with John Gotti in the late 80s. They were involved in a uh, landfill operation that would indeed be found out by the feds. Gotti assumed that Fred Weiss was an informant and he would set up a hit party to go deal with Mr. Weiss. Now, we also will kind of talk about the show I just had on the New Jersey family. Gotti would go to some of his Jersey pals, as well as Joe Watts, and they would set up two separate hit parties to find Fred Weiss. The first person to find Fred Weiss um, should take him out. Now, Joe Watts was in one. He would sit on the home of Fred Weiss. Another group involving Vinny Ocean Palermo, uh, and other New Jersey mobsters would also set up outside of an apartment that Fred Weiss had. In September of 1989, that New Jersey party would find Fred Weiss and whack him uh, in front uh, of that apartment. So Joe Watts was a part of the conspiracy, but he ultimately didn't have a hand in actually killing Fred Weiss. But for the feds, that was enough to jam him up in a conspiracy. Also involved in this indictment was a separate case involving someone called Victim One in a prison assault case that Joe Watts would have to explain. According to the feds, Victim One was a person called Abe Berger. Now, inside in prison, Joe Watts would come into contact with Mr. Uh, Berger. Mr. Berger claimed he was a famed stock wizard and he could make Joe Watts money uh, trading stocks. Joe Watts falls into a trance and believes that Mr. Berger can actually make him money in the stock market. Joe Watts would funnel him $400,000. Ultimately, though, Mr. Berger was not a stock wizard and lost him the money. According to the federal government, uh, Mr. Watts uh, sent an emissary to take the money to him. He would then ask for the money back after he found out that there was no money. 
Uh, Watts began, quote, threatening victim one on one occasion. Watts and another individual involved, fronted victim one in Manhattan and physically assaulted him. He also at one point physically shoved victim one against the wall. Now, this would be brought up in this case involving Joe Watts. And Joe Watts' attorney, Gerald Chargell, would say essentially that Berger defrauded Watts of $400,000 claiming to be a wizard at picking stocks and that Watts didn't really do anything. He allegedly just slapped him in a vicious rage to get back his indictment or his investment. Now, ultimately for this case and for the involvement in the Weiss killing, Joe Watts, again, didn't get a life sentence. He was given 13 years. And in that uh, uh, sentencing, the judge in the case uh, would tell Joe Watts, quote, you should have called the cops or brought a lawsuit. You can't run around beating someone up and that you're not entitled to resort to self-help to collect on the debt. Uh, she would also uh, call Watts uh, a vicious killer uh, and that he belonged behind bars. She would hit him with 13 years. Joe Watts would be released in 2022. And as far as I know, uh, is a free man. Now, uh, he is 80 years old. We would essentially think that he would probably live out the rest of his golden years in relative anonymity. Now, uh, I want to end this on an interesting story. According to the book uh, For the Shadow of My Father by John Gotti Jr., he would tell him a very interesting story involving Joe Watts and his father, John Gotti Jr. Uh, Gotti Jr. would contend that one night, the two were set to go watch Frank Sinatra perform at Carnegie Hall. Um, Sinatra had given Gotti tickets and that they were excited to meet him backstage and have dinner, except at the end, uh, as they were reported to go, Sinatra decided he was sick and couldn't do the, the concert that night. Uh, they head to a place called the Savoy Grill to have dinner, but who should walk in? Frank Sinatra. So Frank Sinatra basically wasn't really sick and decided he was just going to have dinner and gallivant around. John Gotti, according to the book, was so furious, he sent Joe Watts to the table uh, to basically uh, ask uh, Sinatra what the fuck happened. According to the book, Joe Watts would say to Sinatra, quote, the next time John sends for you and you make up an excuse, I'll be the last face you see on earth. I'll admit, I wouldn't want to see that face as the last face on earth, if I were Frank Sinatra either. A fascinating story of one of the most respected people in the history of the mob. As I said, Meyer Lansky would once be compared to Joe Watts. That's how much respect Joe Watts had. He was respected, he was cold-blooded, and he made money. Something for the mob you can be keep kept around for a long time. Joe Watts, just another mob story. As always, if you appreciate and like the video, please hit the like button. And make sure you subscribe. We'll see you next time.